Thank you very much, Alan. It's very kind of you. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever been to New York, but just on the corner of Central Park and Fifth Avenue, there is an iconic building, the Plaza Hotel. It's beautiful, there's the, the Oak Room Bar. It used to be that unaccompanied ladies were not allowed in the Oak Room Bar. I think they changed that uh, slightly more recently than one might expect. Uh, there are many great uh, meetings have been had there. Lady Gaga has played there. A bunch of uh, finance ministers signed a currency uh, manipulation agreement there in the 1980s. There's all kinds of, really the whole gamut. But the meeting that I want to discuss today took place in 1953, 10 days before Christmas. And it was a meeting between four, the presidents of four of the largest tobacco companies in the United States. And they were meeting with uh, John Hill, who was a PR guru. He was the head of uh, Hill and Knowlton, public relations firm. And it was a crisis meeting. The reason for the crisis was, turns out, cigarettes give you cancer. <laughs> so German scientists had demonstrated this fairly clearly in the 1930s, but nobody really wanted to talk too much about what German scientists had been doing in the 1930s. Then Richard Doll and uh, Austin Bradford Hill in the UK uh, demonstrated a pretty clear link. That basically, the, almost everyone with lung cancer was a, was a smoker. Um, then in uh, the United States, uh, Ernest Winder and Evarts Graham demonstrated that you could induce cancer, randomized controlled trial, if you painted um, condensed tobacco smoke, the tar that comes from condensed tobacco smoke, on the backs of mice you could produce skin cancer on the backs of mice. So there were, and for some reason, that seemed to be a more powerful, uh, powerful finding than, than what Dole and Bradford Hill had found. But really, none of that was the problem. The problem was the Reader's Digest, which is the most popular, widely read magazine on the planet, had published an article with the title, Cancer by the Carton. So you have a problem because your, your only product is not only obviously addictive, but also now incredibly dangerous. And all of the modern um, discussions about healthy eating and causes of cancer, that, well, it does burnt toast cause cancer? Maybe bacon causes cancer. Maybe cling film causes cancer. I mean, some of these are, connections are real and some of them are, are nonsense. But What's obviously true is none of them, none of them are remotely close to being as significant as the link between cigarettes and cancer and all kinds of other illnesses. This is an absolutely fatal product. So it's awkward. It's awkward. And Alastair Cook, the great um, observer of uh, America, in 1954, he, he harked back to Sir Walter Raleigh bringing the, the <coughs> tobacco to Europe. And in 1954, Alistair Cook wrote that really the publication of the next serious scientific study into the link between cancer and cigarettes, the next, the next study that was published, that might well end what Sir Walter Raleigh began. <coughs> but John Hill, the PR guru, had a plan. And the plan, it turns out, worked incredibly well, because for decades, the tobacco companies were able to fend off regulation and litigation, and even the perception among their customers that the cigarette, I mean, yeah, maybe, 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 they might be slightly bad, It'd give you a cough, anyway, just, they, they managed to hold back all of these things for a tremendously long time. And this was despite absolutely, you know, unarguable scientific evidence, unimpeachable facts, incredibly credible scientists, and yet the credible scientists weren't believed. The indisputable facts ended up being disputed. And the doubts just rolled on and on for years and then for decades. And there are lots of different arms to John Hill's strategy, lots of different ways in which it worked. But we we now know quite a lot about it, and one of the reasons we know a lot about it is after a 1998, a huge 1998 settlement in the United States, uh, a lot of the internal documents 
produced by the tobacco companies and by their public relations firms have become public, publicly available and publicly searchable and they've been exhaustively examined by academics and journalists. And there's one that was written in 1969, a particular memo that I think is, has become iconic, just discussing how is it that we are going to fend off these claims that cigarettes are incredibly bad for you. And there's this line in this memo. And the line is, doubt is our product. And we're not just going to make cigarettes, we also need to manufacture doubt. And for all these years, the expert evidence, the statistics, the facts, they couldn't quite break through against this wall of doubt. Oh, I'm a fan of facts, of course I'm a fan of facts, um, but I, I couldn't help noticing the irony that Facebook chose to celebrate the 63rd anniversary of the meeting at the Plaza Hotel with a press release. Uh, I don't think it was deliberate, but the press release was all about how Facebook was going to combat fake news. So all these lies that people tell on Facebook, Facebook was going to fix that. And the way they were going to fix it was um, if people thought that something wasn't true, they'd be able to flag up this fake news story and say, I think this is not true. Then, I mean, none of this is quite transparent, but it would then pass to fact checkers. And of course, you know, I love fact checkers. Some of my best friends are fact checkers. You know, I myself, I have dabbled myself in fact checking. Okay, so we'll go to the fact checkers. And the fact checkers would check their facts and they would say, well, this turns out not to be true. And then it would go back to Facebook. Then Facebook would put a flag on the story saying, oh, this story is disputed by independent fact checkers. You may want to go and check the independent fact checkers' independent facts. <laughs> and it might even, it might even, although the details of this were not discussed, it might even be downgraded in the algorithm. And this means that you, you would just be less likely to see it. And Facebook is showing you things you might want to see. And so maybe you might not want to see things that are manifestly untrue. We might, just, we might downgrade it in the algorithm. Now, of course, why were they doing this? Well, they were doing this because Donald Trump got elected, basically. They were doing this because it was, it was in the air. It was suddenly, we had noticed that uh, a man who was perfectly happy to just say something that wasn't true, <coughs> was demonstrably untrue, and then he'd be corrected and say, you know, Mr. Trump, when you said you never said that uh, China invented global warming, here's your tweet saying that China invented global warming. They'd just say, oh, I never said that. I never said that. Um, you, know, you, you know you spread all those rumours about Barack Obama not being um, born in the United States? That was Hillary Clinton. She spread those rumours. Just, you know, and just seemed impossible to, to get through this wall of willingness to just say things that weren't true. Uh, I didn't put that slide up there, but, uh, you know, let's not mention the bus. <laughs> it just seemed, it, the, politicians have always been willing to say things that aren't true, but it seemed that a line had been crossed where you say something that is demonstrably untrue, clearly untrue, and uh, authoritative figures, for example, in the case of the bus, Sir Andrew Dilnot, the former presenter of More or Less, the head of Nuffield College, and the chairman of the UK Statistics Authority says, you know what, that number on the bus, that's misleading. Uh, no, it's not, it's completely true. Did this willingness to just plough on is perhaps one of the reasons why our friends over at the Oxford Dictionaries named post-truth their word of the year. So this sense that somehow the truth no longer had this purchase, the truth no longer seemed to matter to people. This is what Facebook were responding to. And the idea, and more traditional journalists have responded in a, in a related way. We need, to, we need to check more facts, we need to use more fact checking, we need to rebut untrue claims. It's basically, it's the same thing as Facebook are doing except without the algorithms. And the idea is, well, that will then lead to a more informed electorate and more reasoned political discourse and better decisions and more respect for the truth. That's the idea. And I'm not sure that that is actually going to happen. I'm not sure that, or at least, I'm not sure that that is remotely enough. Now, re re remember that memo, doubt is our product. It's not enough to just have fact-checkers rebutting 
untrue claims. As long as there is still doubt out there, the controversy continues, and some people thrive off the controversy. We have to remember that the tobacco companies were able to, to muddy the waters partly by hacking the norms of science and the norms of journalism. They, they had this judo move that would turn, turn both journalistic norms and scientific norms around to become self-defeating. So you could just call for more research. We need more research. Who, who doesn't want more research? I, all I'm ever told by scientists, whenever I tune in and listen to, to Robin Ince and Brian Cox on Infinite Monkey Cage, they're always telling me, well, all scientific truth is provisional. You know, it's always subject to, to, to disproof. So the tobacco companies just take that idea and run with it. Well, they, some people say they cause cancer, but we need more research. And the journalistic norm is of objectivity and balance. So if a, a tobacco company produces something that seems objective, and of course they have a view on whether cigarettes cause cancer, and balance demands that you report the tobacco company's view on whether cigarettes cause cancer, and so the controversy continues. Now in the 1950s, the 1960s, we weren't smart to this. You know, there were, it was a tremendously sophisticated campaign, and I understand why a lot of people were caught out by it. A lot of my people, a lot of journalists were caught out by this. But it's 2017 now, and I, I still see some of the same moves being used, and I still see them having the same effect. And I, and I think that some of the techniques that we're using, the, the rebuttal, the insistence on, well, let's just start with the facts. I love facts, but I'm not sure it's working. I mean, take, take the fake news issue. So let me give you a piece of news. Pope Francis shocks world, endorses Donald Trump for president. It's the most successful story on Facebook in America in the three months before the election. By most successful, I mean it had the most engagements, the most, uh, the most likes, dislikes, shares, comments. People were interacting with this story. They were, and, and of course, that of course is part of the problem. In 2014, Mark Zuckerberg described Facebook. He keeps saying it's not a media company, but he also described Facebook as, as the, the most perfect newspaper. He said, our goal is to build the perfect personalized newspaper for every person in the world. He said, we're going to show you the stuff that's going to be most interesting to you. But of course, if you are really interested in the story <coughs> that Pope Francis endorsed Donald Trump for president, now that, that's the perfect something, but I'm not sure it's the perfect newspaper. Because, spoiler alert, Pope Francis did not endorse Donald Trump, okay? <laughs> Didn't happen. So, of course, we, you know, we get very, very excited about fake news. I was at a meeting of the Royal Statistical Society last night, and there was a lot of talk about fake news. But I think that's partly journalists like me really feeling insulted that this sort of stuff looks like news and gets traded around Facebook. And by the way, a lot of it is not coming out of the Kremlin or indeed out of hyperpartisan right-wing blogs. A lot of it is just being manufactured by teenagers uh, it, from California to Macedonia because people click on it, and if you click on it, you can sell adverts. So this is the ultimate insult, because I can assure you newspapers are not making a lot of money. So it turns out that fake news is more profitable than actual news. And it seems it's more politically successful as well. So we, of course we're insulted and we, we want something to be done about it. And, and I, I think something should be done about it. And I suspect that Facebook's tweaks to the algorithms probably will be effective. But what I also think is that the focus on fake news is a distraction. This is not the main issue. Um, now we can quantify this. <coughs> Ironically, the Royal Statistical Society panel discussion last night did not try to quantify fake news. But we economists, we're the proper nerds, forget the statisticians at the RSS, proper nerds try and quantify these things. So a couple of economists, Hunt Alcott and Matthew Jenskow. Matthew Jenskow, by the way, is one of the most respected economists in the United States, won the Bates Clark Medal, which has also been won by uh, Nobel laureate Joe Stiglitz, Nobel laureate Gary Becker, Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, by Steve Freakonomics Levitt. I mean, it's, it's, it's serious winning the Bates Clark Medal. And he studies media, media markets, polarization and media bias. So Hunt Holcott and Matthew Jensko saw all this fake news going around and they said, we need to quantify this and we need to get a research paper out quickly. So various tra trawls through Facebook's data 
and checking with independent fact-checking sites, and they think they quantified the amount of fake news on Facebook. And it turns out that if you just look at the top most shared stories, fake news looks like it's doing extremely well. And of course, part of the reason is there is actually only one story that says that Pope Francis endorsed Donald Trump. Whereas any true story, there are hundreds of different, if you go to Google News and Google any true story, there are hundreds of versions of it. So any particular one version of that story may not be very widely shared. So it turns out that the total volume of fake news is not that big. It's not that small, but it's not that big either. So there were 38 million shares of fake stories in uh, the 90 days before the election. Now, 38 million, sounds like quite a lot. 30 million were pro-Trump, 8 million pro-Clinton. Um, they, 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 apparently, they tried getting uh, fake news stories going around Bernie Clinton. Uh, 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 Bernie, uh, <laughs> Bernie, Bernie Clifton, yeah, no, not Bernie Clifton, uh, of Bernie Sanders. They tried to get um, Bernie uh, Sanders fake news stories going, but it turns out Bernie supporters weren't interested in clicking on it, so um, they, no, there's no money in trolling Bernie Sanders. So, um, so there was 38 million fake news stories. It sounds like a lot. Well, that's 420,000 shares a day. Okay, now, a paper copy of the New York Times contains multiple true stories on every page, and a lot of pages. And there are more than 420,000 paper copies of the New York Times sold every day. So 420,000 fake news stories, it's not nothing, but it's not that much. And Hunt and Jenskow tried to quantify, could it have swung the election? It was quite a close election. Um, could it have swung the election? Maybe if if one fake news story had the same impact as 36 TV campaigns, which is possible, but I think stretches the boundaries of credibility. So Jensko estimates that the typical voter, there are 130 million voters, the typical voter could remember seeing exactly one fake news story, well, approximately one fake news story. I think it was 0.98 fake news stories in the, in the 90 days. So it's just, it's a lot of people... Didn't, couldn't remember ever seeing any fake news stories. And of course, a lot of people who did see fake news stories didn't believe them. So it's unlikely that fake news is really the issue. I think that the problem lies somewhere else. Um, remember the tobacco strategy. There's a handwritten note in one of the tobacco memos from the 1970s, and it says, the key point, keep the controversy alive. As long as we're arguing about fake news, we're not arguing about the issues that really matter. Now, I want to say, I think fact-checking, both in terms of the, the narrow specialist websites like fullfact.org, which is wonderful, and uh, independent think tanks like the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and fact-checking by mainstream journalists, the BBC, the Financial Times, the Guardian, the Times, just establishing what is true and what isn't and how we know and what the sources are, it's incredibly important. It's, it's foundation. If we don't have the statistics to understand how the country works, what the budget of the National Health Service is, what the deficit is, what the unemployment rate is, what GDP growth is, um, what the inflation rate is, if we don't have those sorts of statistics and we don't do our, our very best because no statistics are perfect, but we do our very best to collect the most rigorous and robust statistics. And we, if we don't have agreement on what those things are, then we're, we're really in trouble. We've got, we've, got, we've got nothing, really, except feelings about politics. So facts are incredibly important. But I think it's, it's, it feels comfortable for people like me, and I suspect for many of the people here, it feels comfortable to think that just... Just explain the facts. Just give people the facts. Show them the facts. Show them what's true. It feels that that should be enough. And it's not enough. That's never enough. And I have some facts to prove that the facts are never enough. <laughs> so one issue well documented in psychology is... Uh, I mean, there are three different issues, but they all have the same name, which is confusing. Blame the psychologists, don't blame me. They go by the collective name of the backfire effect. 
The backfire effect is I give you facts and you get stupider. Okay? So how does this work? Well, number one, the backfire effect sometimes operates on memory. So the the most ridiculous example of this is when, in a, you sometimes see these in court dramas, somebody says something outrageous in court, and then the judge says, the jury will disregard what was just said. And of course, no one, well, no one can ever disregard what was just said. You can't just make yourself, we're not, we're not computers, you can't play, press delete and wipe that memory back. Of course you remember what was said. And it turns out it's surprisingly difficult to forget untrue information. So one classic study of this gave people an account of a fire. There's been this fire, and I need you to read this account of this fire, and uh, various pieces of information come, come about, and it turns out there were some, there were some uh, paints in this warehouse where there was this fire, and um, that may have been something to do with why there was so much smoke and so on. Da, 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 da. Anyway, and, and it turns out that later investigation reveals that actually that thing about the paints is not true. There weren't any discarded paints in the warehouse, no paints at all. Mo move on, further discussion of the fire. Um, and then you start to ask people, well, you know, why was there so much smoke? And they would say, well, because of the paints. It, but you, were the paints there? Oh, no, 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 no the paints weren't there. I, I, I remember the paints weren't there. But it, it, people's, people's interpretation of what they'd seen was coloured by the fact that they'd been given false information. And the false information had been withdrawn, but it never really completely gets withdrawn. Now, the irony is, the more often I rebut a myth the more often you hear it. And the more often you hear it, the more often you remember it. And it's kind of difficult to remember that it's untrue. Um, when I spoke to Andrew Lillico, of, who was one of the, the uh, leading economists on the Leave campaign, uh, who I believe is a very truthful man, I was asking him about this claim on the bus, 350 million a week. It's not true, by the way. It's completely untrue. Uh, provably untrue. Um, and I talked to him about it, and he said, yeah, I know, it's, kind of, it's not really true, is it? I mean, he was like, well, you know, but if you, uh, but no, it's not true. Um, <laughs> um, and he said, I wish they hadn't, they didn't, they didn't ask me, I wish they hadn't gone with that number, you know, because they could have said, I forget, 225 million maybe, I think. You can really justify 225 million. Uh, it's hard, really hard to say that that's untrue. Um, and to be honest, who cares? Right? Who cares whether it's 350 million or 225 million? What I mean, the, the basic message, we, we send money to the EU, we could spend it on the NHS, the basic message would be the same. It's just one would be false, and one would be factually correct, and we can argue about the economics of it all. But the thing is, I think, for, from a political point of view, Lilico, he was, this was an honourable remark, but politically he was completely wrong, because if they had put 225 million on the bus, Nobody would ever have talked about it ever again. And that would just have faded away. But all the Remain campaign did, aided by me and aided by my fact-checking friends, is just bang on about the 350 million and how it wasn't true. And of course, a lot of, people, a lot of what people were hearing was, oh, 350 million, yeah, I remember. But familiarity is tremendously powerful. And of course, familiarity is often a very powerful way of making decisions. So the psychologist Gerd Gigerenza has assembled um, stock market portfolios by stopping people on street corners and showing them a list of companies and saying, do you recognize any of the companies on this list? And he, he assembles a portfolio of stocks that people have never heard of and stocks that people have heard of. And it turns out that robustly, the portfolio of stocks that people have heard of does better in the next year. So he did that in the middle of the dot-com boom and outperformed all of the professional stock pickers. And then people said, well, uh, that was the dot-com boom. You, so he said, okay, well, we'll do it again. Then he did it in the bust, still worked. The companies that people had heard of did better. So, you know, the familiarity, just having heard a claim, you know, there's, there are evolutionary reasons, I think, why we, we cling on to them. But if you want to rebut something, just constantly going on about the thing that isn't true doesn't seem to help. So that's one aspect of the backfire effect. The second aspect of the backfire effect is simply a really simple message sticks, and fact-checking is often complicated. If you go to um, Reality Check on the BBC or to Full Fact, these are great sites, I'm not criticizing these sites, you, you go down and you just, gosh, the, the footnotes and the explainers, and it, oh, it all depends what you mean, and well, you know, but if you measure from 1978, then it is true, but, no, but the, this claim was from 1984, and that's not really true, and, and, and um, and I know exactly why they do this. They have to do this because they have to be absolutely meticulous 
because they're interested in the facts. And not only interested in the facts, in documenting their reasoning. Exactly how did they come to reach this conclusion? And you can follow the hyperlinks and you can look up the sources and you can go to the Office for National Statistics. Of course, it's vital that you do it that way. If you're in the fact-checking business, there is no other way to do it. But it's not persuasive. It's not supposed to be persuasive. That's not the design of the website. But that's why when Facebook flag up, hmm, this may not be true, go and look at a fact-checking website, I'm not sure that's going to work. Because people remember the simple truth over the complicated one. And this has been documented in incredibly complicated research papers that I'm not going to describe to you, because I hope that you're going to absorb the simple truth of what I just said. <laughs> now, the third issue, the third source of the backfire effect, I, I need to take a step back. It, it's all about something we call motivated reasoning. Now, the motivated reasoning is, you know, I'm an economist. We don't, we don't do this psychology stuff. So um, I, all I wanted to do to understand motivated reasoning was to go to this classic psychological study. Um, and it was a study of a football game. Uh, well, actually, an American football game, or as they called it in America, a football game. Um, 1951, there's a football game, college football game, between Princeton and Dartmouth. And it's not a very nice game. A lot of fouls, it's pretty ill-tempered. Both quarterbacks have to leave the field with injuries. One of them has to be stretched off because he's got a broken leg. It's not, it's not a nice game. So a uh, short time after the game, uh, I think it was a week, uh, two psychologists, Albert Hastorf and Hadley Cantrell. Hastorf's at Dartmouth and Cantrell's at Princeton, and they, they're aware of this game. They give the same survey to their students, you know, the Princeton students and the Dartmouth students, and they ask them about this game, you know, the, the students who saw the game. You know, was it, was it bad-tempered? Was it, was it tough but fair? Or was it just, you know, tough and unfair? And if you thought there were problems, who started the problems? Was it Dartmouth or was it Princeton? And all these sorts of questions. And what they found, I think unsurprisingly, is basically the Dartmouth students thought that Dartmouth was pretty blameless and Princeton were a bunch of animals. And the Princeton students thought the same about the Dartmouth students. And I don't think that's incredibly surprising. But then a couple of years later, uh, the researchers did a, a much more interesting study. They got video of the game and they showed it to their students. And they said, what I want you to do is count maybe not quite objective truths, but near objective facts about the game. So how many infringements did you see? Who committed the infringement? Was it a serious infringement or a trivial infringement? Now, of course, there was, there was room for opinion in these judgments, but fundamentally, I'm not asking you, you know, who behaved better. I'm asking you to count fouls and, our, and, and who committed them. And the title of the study is, They Saw a Game. And the idea behind that title is, well, it would be nice to say they saw the game, but it seemed that everybody was seeing their own version of the game. They were watching the same videotape, but they weren't seeing the same events. They were filtering them because of their own partisan bias. And of course, that's football, and you know, you've met football fans there. You know, maybe it's just about that kind of tribalism. Um, well, it turns out not. It turns out we see the same thing in politics. So there's a fascinating study by Dan Cahan at Yale of the same sort of thing, only in political protest. So he has video of protesters outside a building. You know, placards and, you know, they're yelling away and they're, yeah, they're doing what protesters do. So there are four arms to this experiment. It's a randomized controlled trial. In one arm, he shows the footage to liberal students, lefty students, and he says, these are pro-choice, anti-abortion activists and they are protesting outside an abortion clinic. The second group still liberal lefty students. He says, these are lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans activists, and they are protesting outside an army recruitment center against the then policy of don't ask, don't tell, uh, where uh, if, you were, if you were queer and you went into the military, you had to keep quiet about it and they promised not to ask any questions. They were protesting outside the army recruitment center. The third box, in this randomized controlled trial, they showed the video to conservative right-wing students, and they said, 
it's the pro-choice anti-abortion protest protesters outside the abortion clinic. And the fourth, of course, they showed them, the th it's all the same video, they, they showed it to the conservative, the right-wing students, and they said, these are LGBT activists protesting, don't ask, don't tell. And then they said, what do you think of this protest? But they didn't just sort of say, well, you know, how does it make you feel? And, you know, do you think the protests are justified? They would say things like, did you see the protesters obstruct the entrance to the building? Did you see protesters screaming at passers-by? And it was just like they saw a game. What people saw was heavily mediated by their emotional responses to the protest. If they felt that the protest was justified, they didn't see anybody obstructing the door, they didn't see any screaming, they didn't see any trouble. But if they felt that the protest was unjustified in a cause they disagreed with, then they saw all kinds of infractions and infringements and unacceptable behaviour. So our, our perception of what should be objective reality is coloured by uh, our feelings, by our, by our very identity. And so there are very interesting studies of this when you present people with ideas about gun control, when you present people with ideas about climate change, when you ask people, did the US Army find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or not? Highly partisan issues. Uh, and it turns out that people who are, in general, more informed, so for example, people who know more about science, better qualified scientists, score higher on tests of scientific ability, you would think when you present them with a scientific question like climate change, the more informed you are, the less your political views should matter. And if, you're, uh, if you don't know anything, then maybe you just fit into your tribe. But when you, the moment you know something, of course, you, you cleave to the science. But in fact, the opposite is true. So the partisan divide between Democrats and Republicans about climate change is wider among those who have a high degree of scientific literacy, and it's narrower among those who don't know anything about climate change, which is disturbing. Now, um, there was a fascinating study of the backfire effect, of the idea that you're going to give people more information about something they really believe strongly about, conducted by uh, two psychologists, Brendan Nyan and Jason Reifler. J Jason's at Exeter. Um, Brendan Nyan, I think, is at, uh, I think he's at Dartmouth. Um, and they've studied this in various contexts, but I think the, the most famous study was of um, the flu vaccine. And they said, OK, um, you get a whole bunch of people. It turns out that 43% of Americans think the flu vaccine can give you flu. Uh, the flu vaccine can't give you flu. Although there I am with my facts. That's not going to work. <coughs> so they ran a randomised control trial. And I got a whole bunch of, of people and who had, you know, then maybe they were going to vaccinate themselves, maybe they weren't. They had different feelings about the flu vaccine. Um, and they showed some of them the Centers for Disease Control advice on specifically on the misconception that the flu vaccine causes flu. Does the flu vaccine cause flu? No, it turns out the flu vaccine does not cause flu. Uh, here's why it doesn't cause flu. Um, here's what it might cause. Um, you know, soreness of the arm, uh, maybe a headache. Um, here's why that happens. If you have any further, uh, you want more detail, here are the randomized controlled trials. We're not going to summarize them all, but you can click through and read them. Now, here's what's interesting. If you give people that information and then you say, OK, you thought that the flu vaccine caused flu. What do you think now? People would say, OK, I accept the flu vaccine does not cause flu. Then if you say, OK, are, are you planning to get vaccinated? No, no way. They were significantly, both statistically and practically, significantly less likely to express an intention to be vaccinated after they had been shown and accepted the evidence that the flu vaccine doesn't cause flu. And what seems to be going on, I mean, this effect is now under exhaustive examination by psychologists, it's fascinating. What seems to be going on is, really, my concerns about the flu vaccine, they're not really about, does it cause flu? They're about something much deeper, about sharp needles or not trusting the government or, um, you know, the polluting my body or something. There's something quite primal going on. And when you give me the evidence that flu vaccine doesn't cause flu, and there was a very, very similar study done uh, of MMR um, and autism, and the same thing, 
I accept that the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. I accept that all of the evidence on that was just junk science. Um, yeah, I, I believe you. Uh, are you going to vaccinate your kids? Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so, Mr. Scientist. Um, what's going on is, as I give you the information, in a narrow way, you accept the information. OK, I accept that, that the flu vaccine doesn't cause flu. But then emotionally, I'm thinking of all the reasons I don't want to get that flu vaccine. I'm fighting back. And subconsciously, I'm calling to mind all of the different reasons why I, I don't want this to be true. So, do you think Donald Trump is a sex pest? Absolutely not. Here is tape of Donald Trump boasting about sexually assaulting women. Now do you think he's a sex pest? OK, now I, I accept Donald Trump is a sex pest. But my vote for Donald Trump was never about you know, him being polite to women. It was about he was going to shake Washington up. So you give people a narrow fact, they accept the narrow fact, and then back they come with all kinds of other reasons, because there are always other reasons. Now, um, Nyan and Rifler, by the way, they did run a randomized controlled trial of fact-checking. And the good news for my fact-checking friends is fact-checking probably helps a little bit. Okay, so they, they exposed people to, to, to fact-checking for three months before the 2014 congressional elections in the United States. So people either got to read regular news or fact-checking briefs from sources like PolitiFact and, and Full Fact. And it turns out that the fact-checking improved people's knowledge. They knew more about the facts. They were better informed about politics. Um, I mean, from an incredibly low level to a, a low level. But they were better informed. So, so we didn't see direct evidence of the backfire effect uh, yet. Um, but what we also saw there in that particular randomized controlled trial was the fact checking worked a lot better for people who already had some facts. People who already knew a bit about politics. When you give them the facts, they know more, they absorb more. When people know very little about politics, uh, the fact checking didn't seem to work at all. So I don't think the facts are the answer, or they're not by themselves the answer when you're faced with people who have a strong reason to believe. And just remembering, again, the case of smoking. Who could be more motivated to believe that smoking doesn't cause cancer than somebody who's addicted to cigarettes? What could be more fundamental a belief than this thing that I can't stop, that I chose to, I chose to take up, and now I can't stop? It's not really going to kill me. And by the way, many of the journalists who the tobacco lobby were most effective at using to spread their misinformation were smokers. Of course. Motivated reasoning in action. Now, mentioning Facebook calls to mind this other issue that, that often comes up, um, which is the filter bubble. The idea of the filter bubble, the idea that we live in an echo chamber. These, sort of the, these people who would say, I can't believe that the country voted to leave the EU. I've never met anybody who wanted to leave the EU. Now, where did all these people come from? And, and you know, it's, it's quite a natural response because you know, we, we do tend to hang around in groups of people who, who think like us. Now, Cass Sunstein, one of the co-authors of Nudge, and he was, a, he was a, an official under Barack Obama, a very smart guy, um, he wrote years ago about the problem of echo chambers online. He said the idea is you, know, you could just seek out the more choice you have, the more you tend to seek out people who think exactly like you. And you just talk in your own little bubble to people who think like you. And then Eli Pariser, who was a, a digital activist and now uh, runs the site Upworthy, wrote a book about five years ago now called The Filter Bubble. And Eli Pariser added something to Cass Sunstein's argument. He said, not only are we in this bubble, but the algorithms are making it worse. So when I search on Facebook, I was just, for my series, thank you, by the way, Alan, for recommending 50 things that made the modern economy. You should all subscribe, it's free. Um, I was researching the plow. And I'm like, okay, I need to find out stuff about the plow. Um, uh, you know, I've got some, you know, I've got, got some deep research here, but you know, some basic facts. Let's just you know, Google around and what does the internet tell me about the plow? And of course, when you type in the plow to Google, it says, here's a pub near Oxford called the plow, here's another pub near Oxford called the plow, here's a third pub near Oxford called the plow, because it knows I'm in Oxford. And it obviously knows I like to like a beer. Um, so so uh, Eli Paris's argument is your Google searches that, uh, and Bing searches and other, others, they're all personalized. And that can, in their quest to show you what you want to see, because of course they want to show you what you want to see, there's no malice in it, that might lead you towards biased sources of information. 
And the same thing with Facebook. Remember Zuckerberg's claim, I want to show you the content that's most relevant to you. Well, Pariser says, he's on Facebook, he's politically active, he's left-wing, but he follows lots of right-wing sources because he, he wants to be a, a, aware of what's going on. But he's clicking like and share on the left-wing sources, and he's just reading the right-wing sources. And Facebook's algorithm seems to go, well, you don't seem that excited about these right-wing sources. We'll, um, we'll remove those for your feed, don't worry, to show you stuff that's more relevant to you and your interests. Again, no malice in it. I mean, the, and there's no great you know, saintliness in it either. They're just trying to sell adverts. But um, they're not, it's not designed to do this. It's a side effect of the algorithm. But again, as with fake news, I think it's worth asking how serious is this problem? Now, there's a fantastic, uh, quite informal study by uh, Emma Pearson, who's based here in Oxford. Maybe Emma's here. Are you here, Emma? No, uh, maybe not. OK. Um, she's a statistician at Oxford, and she, um, she studied tweets during the, the troubles in Ferguson. There's a, a young black man shot by a policeman in Ferguson, Missouri, and then people started tweeting about it, because that's what people do. And Pearson analysed all the tweets and she said, OK, there are the red tweets and the blue tweets. And the red tweets say, you know, this is looting and uh, out, you know, outrageous you know, disorder and the police are responding in the right way. And by the way, that police officer was framed and the guy he shot had it coming. And those are the red tweets. And then the blue tweets, which are like, this is, this is noble uh, protest. It's not a riot. It's not looting. It's... Um, it's uh, principled civil disobedience. The police response is outrageous and disproportionate and blah, blah, blah. No, no, contact, no contact at all. I mean, we have all these complaints about Twitter trolls. And of course, Twitter trolls are a problem. But the real problem is these people were not talking to each other at all. They're just retweeting each other. The blue tweets are retweeting the blue tweets. The red tweets are retweeting the red tweets. But here's what's interesting. When you think about Eli Paris's filter bubble thesis, the algorithms make it worse. Twitter didn't have an algorithm in the summer of 2014 when this was all happening. This is all purely based on our choices, about who our friends were and who we hung around with. And Facebook have studied this, and you know, they've published something in Science, which is a respected journal, but it is internal research from Facebook. Facebook argues that their algorithm does politically filter. That is a side effect of the algorithm, but it's quite modest compared with the way that we politically filter by just following people who think like us. Uh, and there's been other studies of this. Um, uh, Seth Flaxman, who's a statistician here in Oxford, and a, gr a couple of colleagues have tried to study this. They got uh, 1.2 million uh, browser users and just checked what news they were reading. And um, the, you know, they were, these were Microsoft browsers. They were sharing data. The people had agreed to share data with Microsoft. So the question is, well, what news do you read when you just type in ft.com? or BBC, news.bbc.co.uk or guardian.co.uk when you type that into your browser versus if you search for a story or versus if you click through from social media, which, which method of reading news is more polarised? And they found there is a small polarisation effect from Google searches, or Bing searches, from social media. It's not that big. And also, which means basically if you click from social media, you're more likely either to be served with you know, if, you're, if you tend right, you'll be served with right-wing stories. If you tend left, you'll be served with left-wing sources. There's more polarisation, but also um, you're more likely to be shown sources for the opposing point of view. I mean, the thing is, what is, what is a filter bubble? If, I mean, if The Guardian or the, the FT or The Times, I mean, they're all filter bubbles. The Daily Mail is a filter bubble. They're all filter bubbles. Reading one newspaper, I mean, it should be The Financial Times, obviously, but um, of course... You, you know, you're just exposed to a particular viewpoint and, and you're relying on the editors of the newspaper to expose you to alternative ways of seeing the world. So they found that actually um, there wasn't a massive amount of polarisation for people clicking from social media and there was arguably more diversity if you did get your news from social media. All of which suggests the filter bubble, it may be a, it may be a problem in the future, it's not a huge problem yet. But you know what is a huge problem? Just a little detail in the footnotes of, of the Flaxman study. There's 1.2 million users that they were examining to see how they consume their news online. In order to actually be analysed for filter bubble behaviour, you had to consume 10 news stories and two op-ed pieces a month. And those sports stories didn't count. 
Do you want to guess how many of the 1.2 million people read 10 news stories and two op-eds a month? 50,000. Four percent. The other 96 percent, yeah, they had a filter bubble. The filter bubble is don't read the news. <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think we, have, we have bigger problems. We have bigger problems than the filter bubble. And to the extent that there is a filter bubble in the way we consume news, it's, it's us. It's our friends and how we're influenced by our friends. We can't blame Facebook. We have to blame ourselves. Just a thought, by the way, on smoking. Smoking is socially contagious. Uh, smoking itself exists in a filter bubble. And quitting is socially contagious. There's a wonderful study by uh, David Cutler and Ed Glazer, two economists, who studied what happens when you've got a husband and wife who both smoke, and one of them uh, is affected by a workplace ban on smoking that makes it more difficult for him or her to smoke, that doesn't in any way affect the other smoker. Uh, and they found this enormous effect. Uh, if your spouse finds it more difficult to smoke, you are highly likely to quit smoking. So smoking apply is, is part of a filter bubble as well. So if, if part of the problem, if a, a major part of the problem is basically just people are not that interested, it's not the filter bubble. It's not motivated reasoning. It's just that people just don't, broadly don't care about any of this stuff. They don't care about the facts. They're not interested. Well, what would we expect to see by people who want to mislead us? We would expect to see not lies so much as distraction. We would expect to see arguments about whether Donald Trump owns a bathrobe or not. We would expect to see arguments about whether the crowd at Donald Trump's inauguration was bigger than the crowd at Barack Obama's inauguration or not. Fortunately, none of these things has come to pass. People are really focusing on the issues that matter. <laughs> There's a wonderful new study being published of the 50 Cent Army. Anyone know who the 50 Cent Army are? If you were Chinese, you would know who the 50 Cent Army are. So the 50 Cent Army are allegedly people who have paid 50 cents an hour to talk up the Chinese government on Chinese social media. So, <coughs> reportedly, tens of millions of people paid by the government to basically just make, you know, spread propaganda on social media favorable to the Chinese government. This fantastic study, it's like a, you know, a spy novel reading this, this work. So first they managed to get hold of a big data leak of loads and loads of people in the 50 Cent Army sending screenshots of their work to a government office saying, I've been posting all this propaganda, can I have my money now? There was this big leak of all this data. So then they're able to identify people who were employed by the government. And then they, they had this fishing expedition where they managed to uh, persuade these people that they were also in the 50 Cent Army and could they give them some advice about the best kind of posts to make. And they were just able to track exactly what the strategies were and what posts were being made when. And the bottom line of this study is a lot of this stuff was not the propaganda you might expect. It was not people arguing against dissidents. It was not people uh, straightforwardly lying about what the government was doing or attacking people who told the truth about what the government was doing. What it was instead was people changing the subject, talking about this cool movie that was on TV last night or uh, celebrations of the Chinese New Year's coming up, talking about the Chinese New Year, or just, just creating noise, just creating a distraction, anything to prevent us focusing on the issue. Which is interesting, I think. Does anybody know who Stanley Prusner is? He has a Nobel Prize. It's in, it's in medicine, though. I mean, obviously, there, there's no Nobel Prize in maths. Um, Stanley Prusner got the Nobel Prize in medicine for discovering prions. So prions are this rogue protein that cause Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and mad cow disease. And Stanley Prusner decided, started investigating this in 1972. He had a patient who had Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Nobody knew what caused it. And there were similar sorts of diseases out there, like scrapie and sheep. And the theory was it was some kind of really, really slow-acting virus. And scientists kept looking for the virus, and looking for the virus, and looking for the virus, and they could never find the virus. And Prusner was looking for the virus, and looking for the virus, and he couldn't find the virus. And in the end, he discovered it's not a virus, it's a protein. A protein causes this condition, which is 
insane. And everybody told him it was insane and that he was a crackpot. And he was gradually marginalised and his funding was withdrawn and the whole sort of story about these scientific heroes. But he managed to find a source of funding to continue his work. R.J. Reynolds, makers of Camel Cigarettes. The heroes of the story. It's no secret. He, may, he thanks them in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. The discovery of the cause of mad cow disease and Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, the Nobel Prize winning discovery, was funded by Big Tobacco. And this is in no way a slant on Stanley Prusner. I've got no argument with Stanley Prusner. He's a great, a truly great scientist. And as far as I'm concerned, he's never said a word about tobacco. Nothing, you know, he's not interested in it. But you know what's interesting about prions? They are not the new story, cigarettes cause cancer. They're something new and different and interesting. And one of the things the tobacco lobby did was to find all kinds of interesting research. Maybe lung cancer is caused by a fungus. There is a fungus that does seem to mimic the conditions of lung cancer. Do you remember sick building syndrome? Tobacco industry. I'm not saying there's no such thing as sick building syndrome. I mean, it seems a bit vague to me. But the point is, it doesn't really matter whether it's true or false. It's not cigarettes cause cancer. It's something else. So I spoke to Robert Proctor, who's a historian who studies this. He told me that um, 10 Nobel Prizes have been awarded to scientists who basically were funded by the tobacco industry. And they're not, they're not kind of junk science. They're not you know, trying to cast doubt on the claim that cigarettes joy. They're just something else to talk about. They're just a distraction, something new. And Robert Proctor said, what's going on here with a lot of these news stories? He says it's the opposite of terrorism. Terrorism is getting, getting excited about a risk that isn't that big, getting upset about a risk that isn't that big. So the opposite of terrorism is trivialism. It's managing to distract people from a huge risk and get them to look at something else. And that's what happened with tobacco. You know, I mean, we still know that cigarettes cause cancer. It's perhaps the, the most or among the most important facts about our health today. It's still one of the most important facts about our health. Do you know how often we mention it in the news? Not very often, because it's not new. It's not new. We do sometimes mention it on more or less, because that's, <coughs> that's how we roll, but not very often. <laughs> so I've, I've told you that just debunking doesn't necessarily work. Just debunking can backfire. It can reinforce myths. It can confuse people. It can um, create a backfire effect where people fight back so hard. They don't want to listen to what you're saying. I've told you that actually a lot of the problem is not uh, the fact that people believe false things. A lot of the problem is that people are just not paying any attention at all, not interested in the facts. They have some feelings. They don't want pesky facts. Is there a solution? What I've said, fact-checking is part of the solution, but fact-checking is just the foundation of the solution. Is there a solution? Maybe there is. So Dan Kahan of Yale published just a couple of weeks ago a paper looking at this old question of uh, people who know stuff about science and what they believe about climate change. And the existing finding, remember, if you know more about science, uh, then the, the polarisation is wider. Republicans and Democrats are further apart in their beliefs about climate change if they're more informed about science. So Dan Kahan measured something else. Curiosity. Like, what do we want to know? How interested are we in surprising results? And he measured it in all kinds of ways. He asked people how often they read science books. He asked people if they, if they enjoyed watching uh, science documentaries, nature documentaries, that sort of thing. It turns out interest in science is distributed across the political spectrum. Republicans are just as interested in science as Democrats. Um, and interest in science is correlated with scientific knowledge, but it's not that closely correlated with scientific knowledge. You can be curious and not really know a lot. And you can know quite a lot and not be very curious. And then, having established this measure of curiosity, he asked, well, do we have the same polarisation or not? And he found not. I mean, Republicans are still more sceptical about climate change than Democrats. But consistently, the more curious both of them are, they move in lockstep. They get more and more concerned. The more, the more curious they are, the more concerned they get about climate change. 
And there are various other studies that are starting to suggest that an interest in the scientific method, an interest in where facts come from, how scientists work, maybe even how economists work, or even how statisticians work, might be more productive than just hammering people with the facts. And what I'm really saying is we need to make people care about the truth. Not just give them the truth, but make them want to know, make them curious, make them ask questions. We need to encourage that, that spirit of adventure, that curiosity. What we basically need is the Brian Cox of statistics, economics, <laughs> politics, and social science. <laughs> Yesterday, he died. So Hans Rosling was the most amazing scientific communicator. I saw him speak many times. He gave this amazing TED talk that's been seen zillions of times uh, with beautiful bubbles floating all over the place and uh, you know, the, the amazing data visualization. He also swallowed swords. He also gave a fantastic demonstration of demography with, with just uh, a pile of toilet rolls, one on top of another. And it wasn't just kind of a, a, a fancy prop. It, it, I really did understand demographic change and the process of demographic change, having seen Hans Rosling messing around with toilet rolls. And the other thing he did, see, he wasn't afraid to give people a real bollocking if he felt that they were asking questions that just came from a place of ignorance. And to, and to encourage them, you, you have to inform yourself about the world. And what, he, what Hans was interested in was what he called factfulness. He said, I'm not, I'm not interested in making an argument. Um, I'm just interested in giving you the facts. That's what he said. But that wasn't quite true. He was never just giving us the facts. He was bringing them to life. He was making us realize that they were important, that they mattered to us, they mattered to making us better people, making us better citizens, better voters, understanding the world around us. And he made them an absolute joy. He made you want to find out more. That's what we need more of. We're going to miss him. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>